All right, we're gonna talk about hopper droppers today. I fished these wrong for years, and it was only after a lot of guiding, a lot of exposure to just plain fishing that I really began to understand how the nymph and dry fly end up working together. So for those of you that don't know what a hopper dropper is, I'm gonna explain it here. I'm gonna take a pretty generic setup, and this is gonna be our hopper, big leggy dry fly with a white poly wing. Uh, it's actually called a chubby Chernobyl. And I'll leave some links to either some collections of flies or flies in the video description. And then below it, we have a nymph that sinks below it, essentially fishing two flies on the end of one line. Uh, and you can fish two flies where it's allowed. So check the regulations. Some fly fishing only destinations only allow for one fly. Uh, so make sure you, you know the regs on where you're going. So it's great when you can fish two flies at once, but two flies can also become a very big distraction as well. Uh, at any point, if you're hooking fish on your dry fly, say more than a ratio of three to one, just get rid of the dropper. It makes, it's a better experience and it makes fish handling a lot quicker because then there's little chance of the fish getting wrapped in the dropper. So I'm adamant that if they're biting the dry fly more than about three to one, just get rid of the nymph. Okay, so hopper dropper. Uh, I'm gonna use the whiteboard behind me to explain one of the biggest fails that most people have when fishing a hopper dropper type setup, okay? And it's not the fly that you use or the diameter of tippet. I'll get into some of those details. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more uh, dynamic than that. So uh, here's my diagram, and I really hope that you guys appreciate the effort that I took in this. So here's a cross section of our river. Uh, the river in this diagram is about three feet deep, which is pretty average trout water. And I've got a hopper floating up here on the surface, and I've got a trout sitting down here somewhere maybe about 12 inches off the bottom. And then I've drawn just kind of a rough sketch uh, about here is where I'm assuming midwater column is for this segment. The fastest currents in the river are typically going to be right along the surface. Those are the surface currents. That, that layer up here is very fast current. Down about 12 inches, it starts to turn into kind of a medium current. Once we get down about halfway to the, the bottom, the currents get very slow, and that's where these trout are eating. So. Imagine this hopper just kind of whizzing by up on the surface, going by the trout very quickly. And the trout is down here spending most of their time uh, living just below the surface of, of boulders and other substrate here. So in this example, it's very common. I've got a rock that you probably couldn't even see down here, but that trout is kind of using that as a current break. So the trout is in even slower water down here. The problem with most hopper droppers is people don't understand that the, the fly, which essentially this is my diagram here, I've got my hopper, is gonna float very, very quickly. And what ends up happening is the, the dry fly gets going way ahead of my little beadhead nymph that happens to be down here, okay? So there's my beadhead nymph. The fly is floating so fast that the beadhead nymph can't ever get, doesn't ever get a chance to sink and get underneath the dry fly, okay? That's the biggest problem. And that nymph ends up just being drugged downstream, going just as fast as this, never really going slowly and working over and hovering over the top of that trout. Because even in three feet of water, if I have an 18 inch drop on my nymph, and if I can get that nymph to hang vertically, I'm within 12 inches of that trout without having to snag the bottom and fish a bobber and a nymph or split shot or heavy flies. It's nothing for that trout when that fly is moving slowly for that trout to float up and take that nymph. Now, how do we fix this? Okay, so part of it we can fix this, this problem of that hopper running ahead. And uh, let me grab a, here, I'll just wipe that with my fingers here. Here's what we're, we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve this fly or this nymph floating down and getting all of its 18 inches more vertically and, 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 and settled out right underneath, right underneath the dry fly like this, okay? There's a, several different ways we do that. One is uh, we fish a bead head that is either bigger or heavier, okay? And this is one I 
took this right off a rig that I was guiding with this morning. And let's see if we can get that in focus. So that's called the Drag Queen, and it's got it's a tungsten bead with a slightly oversized bead, often used for Euro nymphing. You don't have to use necessarily a tungsten jig head nymph, but it does help. And I tie mine on a non-slip mono loop knot when I'm fishing in swift water because I have a tendency to find that that bead will sink head first or that fly will sink head first like that and get down just a little bit quicker, which can be often the difference maker. Okay, so one is you're going to use heavier nymphs. And I'll put a collection to nymphs that are going to sink faster. Now, there's a downside to fast sinking nymphs. And fast sinking nymphs are going to spook more fish. So if you're in flat glassy water, that may not work because now we're making much a much greater disturbance. But it's going to solve that problem of getting down in that bottom half of the water column and really slowing this nymph down. Okay, so uh, that's one item. The other item is I, I tend to find people use tippet that's a little bit too heavy. Uh, they're often using 4X um, in the summer, even 3X to their droppers, or they're using monofilament, which is less dense and doesn't sink as fast. I personally like a 5X fluorocarbon because it's razor thin and really uh, allows that tippet right here. And you can just imagine, uh, where did I put my marker here? On the ground. On the ground. I'm knocking stuff over. Real TV. You can imagine this current having some grip or some traction. The thicker this line is, the more grip that current has on it to just keep pushing the whole unit downstream. The thinner this is, that current will begin pushing through and right around this tippet. As this weight of this fly kind of anchors the system in, that unit will then begin to slice through the current. The thinner that line is, the more ability that fly is going to be able to just pull itself right underneath the dry fly. So between 5X fluorocarbon tippet and a nice tungsten bead, this nymph should be able to swing itself quite vertically right underneath the hopper. Okay, What you can get away with is now we can keep our hopper dropper rig a little bit shorter, a little bit tighter. We don't need to use three feet of line to get down 18 inches. We can use 18 inches of line to get down 18 inches. And I have a lot more control if I can keep that whole unit a bit shorter. So short is good in the hopper dropper game, especially if you're gonna throw it into obstructions like cut banks and sticks and grass. Uh, the other one is just good line management, okay? And you have to have a balance between, um, before we talk about line management, one more thing on the setup. You have to have a balance, and I tied up another rig here uh, that I was using, and we want to talk about just balance between size of dry fly and size of dropper. If I have a, a super duper giant hopper, and just, just picture the hopper this long, and it's buoyant, it's got all this yarn on there, uh, that is going to be so buoyant that it's simply going to take off, and, and the current will have a lot of grip on that fly, and will eventually tow that dropper dimp on an angle and simply tow it downstream. The, the, the dry fly and the nymph have to have somewhat of a natural balance so that when this nymph hangs and gets in that slower current, it actually has the, the ability to anchor that dry fly in and slow that dry fly down just a little bit. You want your nymph to be in charge when it hangs down there in that slower column. So it anchors it in a little bit, settles that fly down so it just can't take off floating it four times the speed that the nymph is going. So there's a balance in selecting that. Generally, if I'm fishing uh, a size 16 dropper nymph, I'm gonna want my, my hopper in about the number 12 or 10 range. If I'm fishing a number 12 with a big tungsten bead, I'm probably gonna need my hopper up there in about the number eight range. And uh, lastly, I'll just touch on fly selection for hopper dropper rigs. Uh, this is called the Blade Runner Hopper. That's one of my favorites. We sell that at Reds. My dropper doesn't seem to tangle around that very much. Casts well, and that white poly yarn really floats nice, and it will actually recover and pull itself back up on top of the surface currents. Chubby Chernobyls are great. Um, not as natural of a hopper imitation, but they do float well. What I would avoid, um, if, you're, if you're straight up hopper fishing, choose the best hopper for the job. Uh, I'll give an example. That's a juicy hopper. It's one of the most natural looking hoppers that we sell. Fish is great as a single dry. I do not like low profile hoppers for hopper dropper rigs. 
uh, they just don't tend to float quite as well uh, as far as the nymph goes, and they just don't tend to tend to fish quite as well. So, if you're hopper fishing, go ahead and go for those real natural looking ones. If you're doing a mix hopper dropper thing, look for uh, patterns that have some type of poly or widow's web or some type of yarn or even elk hair uh, on the top. All right, so we've selected the right gear. We've got the right hopper dropper set up. We understand this principle that that hopper will just run away from the dry fly. If you're fishing an inside corner, um, this happens a little bit less, meaning I'm casting upstream and my nymph might hit in a little faster current than the hopper. That's a great situation. I'm working my way upstream and I've cast it out and maybe I'm casting at a 45 degree angle. That dropper will hit in slightly faster current and immediately go right underneath the dry fly. That's great. That situation, it's really, really easy. There's not even really any mending involved because you should be casting from a point uh, of neutrality. The problem becomes when we start to cast out or work down or feed line. And that's when we really need to make careful mends to put a little bit of upstream tension. Let's just pretend my tippet is up here somewhere. And what I'm gonna do is I'm artificially gonna slow my hopper down. This gets a little bit more technical. So beginners, if you don't completely understand this, don't be scared. We're gonna put a little tiny bit of upstream tension, okay? on that hopper. And that upstream tension is gonna slow that dry fly down just a little bit, allowing that nymph to really hover and hang right in front of those trout and really slow it down. So uh, when I'm really on my, my hopper dropper game and I see maybe, a, maybe I can see this boulder or see this rock and this is floating and let's pretend the current's going that way, I'm gonna put just a little bit of upstream tension on this and that's gonna keep my nymph, which is in water that's moving half the speed of the surface current, moving very slowly and moving in perfect sync with my hopper, which is up top. So uh, those are some tips that I have on hopper dropper fishing for you. There's all sorts of other dry dropper fishing, which is, is a little different. Hopper dropper fishing is pretty specific to talking about hoppers. I'll probably do another video later on at some point, maybe in the fall, and we'll talk about fishing in mergers and where we use like a mayfly dry fly and in a merger, a little bit different deal. I'm really thinking about summertime conditions, hopper flies and swift current when I talk about this setup.